Following the Great Depression, companies entrust design with the task of innovating goods, so that the form itself was self-explanatory and advertising. The figure of the industrial designer in the United States was born in those years. The designer deals with analyzing the company's products and improving them by combining functional and aesthetic aspects. Many American designers come from other sectors, such as advertising and graphics. An immediately recognizable style of the 1930s was that of the streamline, an aerodynamic drop shape that will affect not only the reference sector, such as transport, but also sectors such as furniture and lighting. This style was born in 1933, thanks to Al Wright, one of the two plane inventors, who had the intuition to create the first wind tunnel for Chrysler, a company for which he collaborated. In 1934, the company introduced the airflow model, based on aerodynamic studies. The car was completely different from any previous model. It had an inclined rear window, instead of being straight as at the time. The headlights were integrated into the fenders, and the tail of the car ended in the shape of a drop, to avoid possible vortices. The model was not very successful, because it was something completely different from the one on the market, but it was the beginning of a new design style. The true pioneer of the concept of aerodynamics dates back to the early 900 when Ferdinand von Zeppelin built the wind tunnel for his airships. Airships were competing with aircraft at the time. Serious accidents and exorbitant prices caused the project of the airship to fail. Some of the most important designers of the time were Raymond Loewy, Norman Bell Geddes, and Henry Dreyfus. Raymond Loewy was an American designer of French origin, active mainly in the United States, where he was among the first to have exploited the potential of industrial design from an economic point of view by targeting it to a mass audience. Born in Paris, he soon began to work in the field of design, creating an aeromodel that won the James Gordon Bennett Cup in 1908. The model then went on sale, under the name of Aerel. Loewy served in the French army in World War I, then moved to the United States after the war ended in 1919. He took up residence in New York City, working as a window dresser for several department stores, including the famous Macy's. Meanwhile, he continued collaborating with newspapers and magazines, producing illustrations for Vogue and Harper's Bazaar. In 1929, he obtained the first real commission of an industrial design work, to modernize a Gestetna cyclostyle. He also worked for Westinghouse, designed the body for a Hutmobile, and the cold spot refrigerator for Sears Roebuck. He opened a studio in London in the mid-1930s. His style is recognizable by the curve that has always been a distinctive feature of Raymond Loewy's design. That element that makes a product more aerodynamic, at the base of its concept of streamline, Loewy is the designer who most identifies with the market philosophy of his host country, the United States of America. This brilliant designer is in fact also an excellent entrepreneur. His design offices include a market research unit, a fundamental activity for the completion of his work. Despite the numerous slowdowns that hit him during his career, exemplary that of the Wall Street crisis in 1929, Loewy continues to invest. Until years later, his strategy proves successful. It's important to remember that he worked on the restyling of the Coca-Cola bottle, and that in his last years of work, he collaborated with NASA to define the interior spaces of the space shuttle. He was the first designer to be published on the cover of the Times. An absolute pioneer of this sector, which has been able to combine different aspects of design, passing from graphics to industrial products. Among his most important projects, what best sums up Loewy's general idea, is the restyling of the Lucky Strike cigarette pack in 1942. His work has all the characteristics of his innovation, starting from the simplification of the product to reduce costs. Loewy acts by removing the previous green background, which refers to military camouflage, and was very expensive to print, replacing it with the white background, more pleasing to the eye, along with the red target, thus constituting the iconic logo. This intervention not only significantly reduces production costs, but attracts more attention from the female audience, further increasing sales. Loewy also focuses on product visibility, by applying the logo on both sides of the package. By placing it on a table, the logo would have been seen 25 billion times more, without additional advertising. 
This addition demonstrates its ability to optimize products, even with the smallest of its interventions. Having become a point of reference for professionalism and efficiency in the United States, Loewy opened a graphic design studio in Paris and expanded his client in Europe. He was contacted by the Dutch or giant Shell, which needed a visual identity makeover. The brand traces back to the origins of the Dutch company, when the founder M. Samuel had not yet entered the fuel market, but traded shells to European collectors. The simple red and orange shell on a yellow background was so identifying that it seemed to have always existed, and given its incredible success, it no longer needed to be accompanied by the inscription, Shell. This happens for all companies so influential that they have made their logo a pop element, recognizable at first sight by anyone or almost. Loewy, in addition to having designed many industrial products that have become iconic, with his graphic and communicative intervention, has been able to renew the visual identity of the brands he has worked for, perfectly fitting into the context of the world market. In 1937, Lowy was approached by the Pennsylvania Railroad to work on the modernization of several streamlined locomotives. Lowy designed the aerodynamic covers for K4 Pacific No. 3768 and in 1938 worked on the new carriages to make the Broadway Limited luxury train. He was later entrusted with the design of the S1 experimental locomotive and the T1 class. Later, at the request of the PRR, he restyled the Baldwin diesel locomotives with a shark nose that resembled the T1. Lowy did not design the aesthetics of the famous PRR GG1 locomotive, but contributed to its realization by recommending the use of heat-sealed plates instead of traditional riveted plates. In addition, he proposed replacing the edges with more curvilinear strokes, to be painted in stripes to enhance the softness. Furthermore to these purely stylistic designs, he worked on interior design, stations, leaflets, and other products for the Pennsylvania Railroad. Lowy and Associates worked for Studebaker in South Bend, Indiana in the 1930s. Its products began to be marketed only in the late 1930s, with the attenuation of the effects of the Great Depression. For the Studebaker Lowy also designed the logo, clean and simple, very innovative. The Second World War and the new laws enacted by the government made it difficult for automakers to use their own technical offices, but because Lowy's studio was in effect an outside collaborator, it was not hindered by these restrictions. This allowed Studebaker to launch the first post-war civilian cars, two years before General Motors, Chrysler and Ford. Lowy's studio developed advanced, aerodynamic and aesthetically sober solutions. He designed the body type Studebaker Starlight, with the characteristic rear window wrap around 180 then. In addition to the distinctive bullet nose of the Studebakers of the 1950s and 1951, the studio created the 1953 line, with the Starliner and Starlight Coupes, among the best designed and most beautiful cars of the 1950s, according to numerous specialized newspapers, collectible automobile, car and driver, and motor trend. He also further modernized the logo. His next work for Studebaker was the transformation of Starlight and Starliner into the Studebaker Hawk series for 1956. He was later recalled by Studebaker president, Sherwood Egbert, to design the Avanti. Egbert hired him to create this new line for young people for 1963. Lowy managed to meet the incredible 40-day deadline for a full-scale model. Lowy called around him a team of experienced designers and former collaborators such as John Epstein and Bob Andrews, as well as Tom Kellogg, a young student at the Art Center College of Design. The group retired to Palm Springs working on the new car. Each member of the group had a role. Andrews and Kellogg worked on the sketches. Epstein coordinated the work, and Lowy was the creative director and the source of ideas and inspirations. With the market entry, the Avanti achieved great success and attracted numerous fans. It was produced in limited quantities by several independent companies after the closure of Studebaker, always with excellent sales results. The ideas of simplicity and functionality that Lowy inspired were not new. They had been formulated in Europe by Bauhaus and Le Corbusier but they were made only in objects destined, in small series, to elegant shops. Lowy, in his own right, and as a consultant to the major American industries, has transformed the world of objects, among which the daily lives of millions of people take place. Its rounded edges, 
aerodynamic shapes and bright colors, formal cleanliness, were fundamental to the definition of American design of the 1960s. Norman Bell Geddes was an American architect, designer and set designer. In 1927, Bell Geddes opened an industrial design studio, where he designed everyday objects with refined designs, ranging from cocktail shakers to commemorative medals. In 1933 his studio made some vehicles for Texaco. Prominent exponent of what is now called retrofuturism, in his career, Bell Geddes designed floating airports, majestic skyscrapers, and various means of locomotion. But his greatest work was the realization of the pavilion for the exhibition Futurama, at the World Fair in New York, 1939. Exhibition organized by General Motors. Bell Geddes designed the Mark I, the EAM computer presented by Thomas J. Watson at Harvard. Some viewed it as a waste of resources, as funds could be used to build additional devices. Dreyfus was the most famous of the industrial design celebrities in the 1930s and 1940s, and he greatly improved the appearance and use of a myriad of productions and consumer items. Unlike Raymond Lowy and other contemporaries, Dreyfus did not present himself as a style icon. For his ideology, he applied himself to practical sense, and a scientific approach to solving design problems. His contribution was as prominent in the consumer field, as it was significant in fields such as ergonomics, anthropometry, and human factors. Until 1920 Dreyfus studied as an apprentice set designer, to Norman Bell Geddes, who later became his main competitor, then opened his own studio in 1929, and continued to work on theatrical activities and design. It was an immediate and long-lasting commercial success. In 1955, Dreyfus wrote Designing for People, an autobiography presenting his simplified anthropometric scales, titled Joe and Josephine. In 1960 he published The Measure of Man, a treatise on ergonomics. Nine years later in 1969, he left the company he had founded. Dreyfus was the first president of the Industrial Designers Society of America, IDSA. He and his wife Doris Marks committed suicide in their car, poisoning themselves with carbon monoxide. Earlier that year, she was diagnosed with liver cancer. The design company, Henry Dreyfus Associates, remained in business after his death. That's all. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like or subscribe to the channel if you wish to see other content related to the world of design. See you next time. Bye.